All life known to humankind exists within a thin envelope of air and water that surrounds the Earth. It's called the biosphere. It is an incredibly complex, ever-evolving system of life. Hello, I'm Doug McConnell for the Discovery Channel, and we're at the edge of the Santa Catalina Mountains in the desert north of Tucson, Arizona. And what you see behind me is a two-and-a-half-acre experiment. It's called Biosphere 2. Now, for two years, the ecological systems inside Biosphere 2 will recycle the air, the water, and the nutrients required to sustain life for more than 3,800 species of plants and animals, including eight human beings. Now, for over 10 years, the Smithsonian Institution's Marine Systems Laboratory has been creating large-scale experimental models of self-sustaining ecosystems from throughout the world. Here at Biosphere 2, the Marine Systems Laboratory is responsible for all of the water ecosystems, from a coral reef to a subtropical estuary to a savanna stream. Now, combining their knowledge with information from projects throughout the world, scientists today are striving to learn how people might be able to survive on other planets as well as our own, to create a better understanding of the Earth in our hands. Summer 1989. A revolutionary experiment is underway in the Arizona desert, one that may determine our ability to build settlements on other planets. Inside this unique self-contained airtight test module, scientist Gay Alling has been subsisting for five days, completely sealed off from the outside world. The greenery that surrounds her has been a source of clean water, clean air, and food. The success of this experiment is due in part to the work being done here at the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History by Dr. Walter Aidey in the Marine Systems Laboratory. That dry on, on this side, we do have beach ridges that uh, have cacti. Both experiments are part of an effort to understand what it will take for human beings to survive on other planets. And even more important, how to survive on our own. We humans share our planet and its unique physical environment with millions of other plant and animal species. Collectively, this whole Earth provides our most essential needs, energy, oxygen, pure water, and environmental stability. Four billion years ago, when life was just getting started on Earth, Earth was a pretty tough place for life. Now along come human beings. And uh, we like to get at this storage, this coal and oil. It represents a lot of energy. Uh, we're rapidly pulling it out. We're putting carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. We're putting nutrients back into the waters. We're making very major changes, uh, changes that make the, will make the Earth a different place from what it has been for at least a billion years. Looks like a berry. For centuries, man has been fascinated with the natural wonders of the Earth. The ancient Greeks called it Gaia, Mother Earth, a wholeness composed of many parts, each intimately connected to the rest. Three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water, one of the most amazing compounds in the universe. Water can dissolve almost anything. Its peculiar structure, part liquid, part solid, allows it to hold many chemical elements in solution next to each other. The oceans are a melting pot of elements, allowing the many combinations that lead to life. It was in water and shallow seas that the first primitive signs of life appeared.
Over the ages, an ever-expanding plant growth changed the Earth's surface into the biosphere we know, with an incredible diversity of animal species and a host of interrelated environments. While sometimes disturbed by astronomic events, for thousands of millions of years, this interdependent system developed a dynamic and increasingly complex harmony within itself. Within the past several centuries, that harmony has come under siege. Unfortunately, we humans have always liked to control things, manipulate them to what we think is our advantage. We value only a fraction of Earth species while dismissing many others as unimportant or unnecessary. Within the past few centuries, we've actually begun to threaten the Earth's delicate balance by manipulating parts of a system we still don't understand. Like the child who takes apart a watch without any sense of how to put it back together. To help reverse this trend, the most ambitious ecological experiment ever undertaken is beginning to take shape. A small scale model of the Earth itself. Its designers call it Biosphere 2. Like some futuristic Noah's Ark, Nestled in the Santa Catalina hills of the Arizona desert, Biosphere 2 will eventually house thousands of plants and animals and eight human beings. Sealed away from the rest of the earth, they will live together for up to two years. Except for sunlight and energy, everything they will need to survive, food as well as high quality air and water, will be generated naturally inside the structure itself. After the first two-year test period, if all goes according to plan, Biosphere 2 will continue to function as a living ecological laboratory for up to a century. Ed Bass is one of the founders of the Biosphere 2 project. What we are working with in Biosphere 2 is to develop the basics of a long-term ecological life support system based somewhere off of this planet. The scientific uh, concepts upon which Biosphere 2 is based really uh, models from Biosphere 1, planet Earth. It's a dynamic equilibrium between a number of groups of ecosystems called biomes, which gives it an overall stability that the system has to be complex enough to be ultimately stable. Biosphere 2 will consist of seven interconnected biomes. One for intensive agriculture, another a human habitat. The remaining biomes will include a tropical rainforest, a savanna, an ocean and its reef, an estuary with its marshes and river, and a desert. Dr. Aidy in the Marine Systems Laboratory are chosen to design the estuary, stream, and ocean. Their earlier work with coral reefs had prepared the lab for the job of developing a miniature ocean. They began to study how the biosphere's cycles work, particularly in the oceans. ecosystems to capture their attention were these enormous masses of calcium carbonate, the largest structures built by living things, that capture and convert solar energy more efficiently than any other system, the coral reef. Beautiful and old, they are also very complex communities and much is still unknown about how they work. There are many reasons to be curious about coral reefs. Uh, why do they have so many species in seas that are called nutrient deserts? We really need to know how something as complex as a reef works. We need to know how everything in our biosphere works. To help answer these questions, the Marine Systems Laboratory sets out to recreate a living, working coral reef. If they succeed, 
they will have a means of experimenting, of tinkering with a living system to gain a better understanding of what happens to it under different conditions, and why. Ecology is not an experimental science when it deals with the large scale. It's certainly true that scientists can carry out some very basic experiments with individual organisms and small parts of living systems. But unfortunately, the whole works differently from each of the parts in isolation. We thought if we could construct working models of whole ecosystems, we could not only learn a good deal in the process, but maybe we could also carry out controlled experiments. Most people in the field were very skeptical about this. They just thought it couldn't be done. Their feeling was, we just don't know enough about how the parts work to make the whole thing work. But I had a feeling that it would be possible to bring this community into an aquarium if only we were to include the whole community and not just a small piece of it. Over a period of months, pieces of the ecosystem puzzle are collected and rushed back to Washington in vented coolers. They are placed in a 3,000 gallon tank in the National Museum of Natural History. As more organisms are added, the diversity inside the tank increases. The complex food webs found in wild reefs begin to form. Although to some scientists it seems to go against logic, other scientists have demonstrated that the greater the complexity at all levels within an ecosystem, the more stable the system is. If one species is having a difficult time, there is always another, perhaps just a little better adapted, ready to take its place. In addition to a representative sampling of organisms, two major conditions that affect reef life have to be accurately duplicated as well. Wave action, to keep the limited nutrients in the ocean in constant touch with the plants that need them, and intense tropical sunlight to provide the energy for photosynthesis. Yet at first, the reef's development is marginal. The Marine Systems Laboratory begins to suspect the problem is lack of a supply of fresh, open ocean water running across the reef to supply oxygen and carry off wastes, as it does in the wild. The solution is a device called the algal turf scrubber, a shallow trough containing a plastic screen. Algae quickly attaches itself to the screen and begins to feed on the abundant nutrients, adding oxygen and purifying the water. The research team periodically scrapes off the algae, simulating the action of marine grazers on a wild reef. The model reef inside the tank begins to flourish. The real difficulty with the motto in the Natural History Museum is simply its small size. Large barracuda and sharks won't fit. Even grazers, such as parrotfish and urchins, would grow and eventually become so large that the feeding surface couldn't support them. In this case, our lab staff had to act as the higher predators, uh, as the sharks, if you will, for the motto. While many of the over 500 species reproduced normally, many reef fish require an open sea for their planktonic larval stages. Pretty soon it came clear to us, if we really wanted to increase our understanding of reef life, it was necessary that we work with a larger system. That system turns out to be the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in Australia. Working closely with their counterparts from down under, the Smithsonian team helps to create the largest reef mesocosm in the world. The grand scale of the project allows for greater natural activity within the model. Even the spectacle of the coral reef spawning 
a once-a-year occurrence determined by water, temperature, tides, and the phase of the moon, takes place in the model at the same time the waters in the wild are flooded with eggs and sperm. This spawning activity seems an incredible achievement to the scientists and engineers who built the model. Yet, they had simply allowed nature the freedom to act as it had for millions of years before man's arrival. The success of these models serve as the basis for the water systems in Biosphere 2. To create Biosphere 2, a diverse team of scientists, engineers, and managers has been assembled. It's an intensely collaborative effort directed by Margaret Augustine, project director of Biosphere 2. I think some of the, um, the most challenging areas are the transition zones, that interaction between any one biome and the other biome. And that is both physically in the structure and the engineering, but also it comes into play with the, uh, the people that are working on the projects, the engineers, the biologists, the botanists, bringing them together to work and to start exchanging meaningful data, which will go into the engineering and, and design of any one of those, those areas. A normal workday here consists of up to a dozen different meetings with everyone from astrobiologists to electricians. Today's conference is with the men and women who will construct the plumbing for the water systems. A unique set of problems confronts them. Organisms and their wastes tend to congregate on the ocean floor. And just as human cities need a hinterland, the seabed needs a large body of water that is rich in oxygen, but poor in nutrients. The effects of that bigger ocean will be provided once again by plants, in this case in the form of the algal turf scrubber. Algae provides the model with its most basic needs, energy, pure water, oxygen, and environmental stability. These highly reproductive and fast-growing algae are naturally selected by the system for the algal scrubber community. The success of the algal turf scrubbing technology as a purifier of water systems demonstrates the potential of using natural systems to purify the polluted streams, lakes, and estuaries of the planet. What we don't do is we don't come in with the equivalent of an insecticide. I mean, if we were farming, we'd say, okay, sure. if these guys are eating our plants, they're making it a little more difficult for us to do what we want to do, so we've got to zap them. But on the other hand, as soon as you get into that role, as soon as you get into the pattern of if we don't like nature, you know, fix it the way yeah. we want it. That's, well, that's, that's our arrogance. That, that, that's the thing that the amazes arrogance. me is that, that our arrogance has been for so long that we we need to fix something about nature when rather than understanding that the, whatever cycles, whatever design nature's worked out seems to be better than anything that we can come up with. Meanwhile, other ecologists are designing the ecosystems which will interact with the marine components. A botanist and biome design coordinator for Biosphere 2, Linda Lay, is responsible for evaluating and integrating many of these ecosystem designs. Our analog desert in Biosphere 1 is the coastal maritime deserts of North America and the coastal maritime desert of South America, the Atacama Desert, and also the Namib Desert of Africa. Every day we'll come in here and look at the number of flowers and record how many flowers we're getting because the flowers are a food source for several of the animals that we'll have inside of Biosphere 2. Our analog for the Biosphere 2 rainforest is the Amazonian region. Um, and most of our plant species will be coming from South America. But we're also using other parts of the world as a basis for collecting plants. Of course, there's a huge genetic base of tropical rainforest plants around the world. Biosphere 2 also contains a tissue culture laboratory. Tissue culturing permits scientists to rapidly regenerate whole plants from stored microscopic amounts of plant material. This allows scientists to maintain a large plant bank and a diversity of species in a relatively small system. This is the test module for Biosphere 2, where project scientists have spent up to 25 days of total enclosure. Its atmosphere is constantly monitored to see how levels of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and trace organic gases are being balanced. Air samples are passed through a trap and cooled by liquid argon, 
concentrating the trace gases, which may exist in only a few parts per trillion. A chromatograph separates the gases into their elemental forms, each of which leaves a unique visual signature. This attention to trace gas buildup is a result of knowledge gained from an experiment done in the Soviet Union in the early 1970s. A crew of two men and a woman were successfully sustained for half a year in an airtight 300 cubic meter facility, which included growth chambers for the agricultural crops that supplied nearly half the crew's diet. Meat, milk, and other staples were passed into the capsule from the outside. The experiment started with a six-day supply of oxygen in the module. Professor Joseph Gittelson of the USSR's Academy of Sciences, a pioneer in the development of closed ecological systems, was able to sustain life by using bats of algae to produce more oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. Concerned with environmental quality, Mission Control at Biosphere 2 provides a central location where all the functions of the different ecosystems of the sealed enclosure can be monitored. The computers here will react to any buildup of trace gases in any of the ecosystems, and the biospherians will be advised on how to rectify the situation before it becomes serious. Since the biospherians will be growing their own food, experiments are underway to see which plants and animals produce most effectively under test conditions. Like any farm environment, the intensive agricultural area of Biosphere 2 will have a share of weeds. They will be pulled by hand and fed to the animals, which can convert their energy into food. I think regardless of what we find in this initial major experiment of two years of closure of the Biosphere, that there will be tremendous accomplishments coming out of this. Because no matter what we find, it will be knowledge of how these systems work, how to build them, how they operate. Because the ocean in Biosphere 2 will be relatively small, the estuary will be an important buffer between the land communities and the ocean. But figuring out how to build a working estuary, one of nature's most complex ecosystems, presents new problems for the marine systems laboratory. They start by trying to simulate one of the most complex bodies of fresh and salt water in the world. If they can recreate the intricate dynamics of the Chesapeake Bay, they'll be able to build a tropical estuary for Biosphere 2. Under his other hat as captain of the research vessel Marsis Resolute, Dr. Adi navigates his floating lab towards the areas where the collection of Chesapeake Bay specimens will begin. Estuaries are transition zones between bodies of fresh and salt water, places where people have always tended to gather. One of the difficulties uh, that we're now facing on our estuaries is just the day-to-day -day activities of, of humans, the sewage, uh, the chemicals out of the factories, uh, the runoff from the farms, just the everyday activity of so many humans are beginning to have a serious effect on our estuaries. Also, the rate at which we're learning about how these systems work uh, is unfortunately not keeping up with the rate at which we're affecting the systems. One of the plants gathered provides a natural barrier to another problem facing estuaries, erosion. And just as in Chesapeake Bay, erosion is a major problem. This grass, Bartana alterniflora, along with a community of animals, greatly reduces the erosion both in the bay and in our mesocosm. Without it in the mesocosm, we erode away our beach ridges. Without it on the bay, beach ridges and uh, fences and houses sometimes go into the bay. This is a very tough community to, to a large extent, 
is resistant to wave erosion, as you can see. Also resistant to shovels. Most of the Chesapeake Bay collections are taken as chunks of mud and microorganisms, sand, plants, and animals that fit easily into a picnic cooler. Invertebrates and some fish are captured in these blocks, while others live further offshore and must be netted separately. All right. Oh, Magdalene, aren't they? Wow, look at that. That's, That's fantastic. fantastic. Making a model of a mesocosm, which is basically a large microcosm, is a complicated process. The action of the sun, rain, winds, tides, and currents must be simulated. together uh, we know from experience in the past that we do now have the ability to put such a system together and make it work it is a microcosm it is a model it's a small part of what the bay is it's certainly not a perfect image of the bay but in many ways it acts like Chesapeake Bay acts no model of the Chesapeake Bay would be complete without oysters, which at one time provided the major fishing industry. Today, the bay's oyster population is declining. To help understand why, the Smithsonian team is studying the food web of which the oyster is a part. We're talking about something that's very much akin to an ecological Noah's Ark, if you will, collecting all the animals and plants together and taking them safely off to high ground when the flood goes down. But uh, unfortunately, if you added up all those numbers, they're a very small fraction of what's out there. And just taking a group of organisms and dumping them together in a room, if you will, uh, does not make a functioning system. Uh, in fact, very likely it would make a big mess. Now, we happen to be in a time when the ecologists of the world are mostly saying, well, ecosystems are very complex. Uh, we're beginning to understand them, but there are so many species that it interact in such complex ways that it's just really not possible to try to synthesize or put together a whole ecosystem. What we have found in working with marine ecosystems, putting them in boxes over the last 10 years, is that if you bring a major piece of the community in, 200, 400, 600 species, you provide all of the physical conditions that are required to operate this system. And generally speaking, at least after a few tries and a little manipulation, you can come up with a system that's pretty close to the wild system. In the basement of the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History, the 220-mile estuary is simulated by using a sloping 40-foot box made of plywood and fiberglass. Divided into eight compartments connected by computer-controlled flapper valves, it allows fresh water to flow down the estuary, salt water to flow up, and organisms to go where they will. There are reservoirs for tides. wave buckets for waves. Fans and nozzles for wind and rain. High intensity vapor lamps to bring in the sun. And once again, the action of the ocean has to be simulated. The success of the Chesapeake Bay model is critical to the success of Biosphere 2, where the structure that will eventually house the ocean and marsh are already under construction. In order to provide an airtight seal, the foundation will be made of reinforced concrete lined with stainless steel. To 
prevent the polluting effects of the heavy metals in the liners. It must be coated with an epoxy plastic. Then slowly the model ocean will be assembled. On the wild earth, ocean bottom, beach, marsh environments take thousands of years to develop. And this happens with gradually building sediment. In Biosphere 2, we can't wait for this to happen. Our first task in constructing a model ocean is to bring in the appropriate sediments, to lay them out as they would be from thousands of years of deposition. Only then, at the very end of this long process, do we bring in the very active surface layers, populated with hundreds of species of many different kinds of organisms. What we're doing to our natural world is, is we're taking elements, particularly carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, that have been all tied up by plants. And, and the plants coal. hold them up in all this massive plant body. In coal, those are plants that lived 300 million years ago. Oil, plants that lived 100 million years ago. And all of this is, is bound up or it's stored. And we're pulling this storage out and you know, we're throwing it around. Law of entropy. <laughs> exactly, and, it, and it's, it's just tearing up the, the structure, if, if you will, of, of the natural world. It probably comes as a surprise to most people to realize just how complex a problem it is to build a mesocosm from scratch, especially one that will sustain eight human beings as well as thousands of species of plant and animal. Yet while scientists are struggling with the complicated equations of Biosphere 2, Mother Earth is balancing the requirements of millions of species and billions of human beings, a miraculous accomplishment most of us take for granted but not the designers of Biosphere 2. If the enclosure experiment is going to work, the team at Marine Systems Laboratory needed to create a subtropical ecosystem like the Florida Everglades. Freshwater Everglades is known as the River of Grass. It isn't a single ecosystem, but a complex collection of ecosystems. The grass is actually an elegant sedge that dominates everything in this extremely shallow and slow flowing stream out of Lake Okeechobee. The first task is to find the best places to collect all the life forms needed to simulate a 25-mile stretch of earth and water in Biosphere 2's limited space. Coming in from the open Gulf of Mexico onto the Everglades coast, the first thing we see are large mangrove islands. On these red mangrove islands, there are many beaches, sandy, arcuate beaches with large beach ridges, vegetated in most cases. In between the red mangrove islands are strong tidal currents, which give relatively deep water in some of the passes. Then further inland, we pass across some bays and into black mangrove, enormous areas of blacks, and then finally into scattered white mangroves and buttonwoods. When we turn around and look back, we see among the blacks large areas of salt marshes as well. In a very small system where you're packing it, you're packing animals, there, there are too many animals, so CO2 rises and oxygen is low. And this would be fine in the real environment because you've got hundreds of miles of Gulf of Mexico. But here we don't have that, so we need a device that acts like hundreds of miles of Gulf of Mexico and pulls nitrogen out, pulls CO2 out, puts oxygen in. And, and this is a very simple device to use our algae to carry out these desirable characteristics in a very efficient kind of way. When you uh, say scrubber system, I mean, what do you... What do you well, what do specifically you when we say scrub, we mean this system scrubs nutrients, scrubs carbon dioxide, it scrubs the waste, if you want to call it that, of the animals carbon out of dioxide. the water. Carbon dioxide. Every ecosystem is defined primarily by its plant life. And in the saltier part of the Everglades, the dominant plant is the mangrove. Go 
Once the mangrove collections are complete, attention turns to the coastal areas. The team collects as many species of the creatures who live there as they can find, including one most people regard simply as a pest. Introducing mosquitoes into a closed environment goes against sentiment, but not against logic. Besides, many species do not feed on humans. For them, frogs and birds will do just as well. These incredible flying machines with their built-in gyroscopes make helicopters look primitive by comparison, but it is their reproductive capabilities that interests the ecologist. Male mosquitoes feed primarily on flower pollen, but when it is time for the female to lay eggs, she requires additional food. Millions of years ago, the female mosquito stumbled across a rich source of nutrients, the blood from a wide variety of vertebrates, including man. When she's ready to lay her eggs, the female selects special habitats with just the right moisture levels to deposit them. When the eggs hatch, the mosquito in its larval form appears. The larva is a filter feeder growing and adding new shells several times, like a shrimp or lobster. Most mosquito larvae end up as meal for fish or a dragonfly and are a crucial part of the food chain. Those that aren't eaten eventually pull an amazing Jekyll and Hyde, emerging slowly from their shell in a delicate balancing act on water which could easily drown them. In addition to mangroves and mosquitoes, a broad range of plant life from the beach is also gathered. In Washington, D.C., a greenhouse has been prepared to house a mesocosm with all the environmental characteristics of the Florida Everglades. As with all marine and aquatic models, complex plumbing becomes a major consideration. Evaporation and thunderstorms are intense in the Everglades environment. Because of the small area in the greenhouse, the removal and return of fresh water is accomplished by a reverse osmosis process, which maintains the salinity pattern of the estuary. In this case, the ocean being simulated is the Gulf of Mexico, along with its complex tides. Now that the greenhouse contains an Everglades environment, it is ready for the ecosystem being gathered in Florida. As the time for departure nears, a last few mangroves are taken from the marsh. No one really knows how many will survive the upcoming trip, and it won't hurt to have a few spares. The key to the survival of hundreds of species is getting them back to Washington as quickly as possible. Some will make the non-stop journey north in a specially equipped truck. The rest will be carried north by boat, then transferred to the truck for the final leg. For the next few days, the Marsis Resolute will become a kind of floating greenhouse and wetland where the fragile passengers must be kept warm and moist. Unlike most newcomers to summertime in the nation's capital, these visitors won't mind the humidity and heat. Eight separate tanks, each with its own salinity level, are required to house the new arrivals. Most seem to have survived the trip north in good shape. The idea is to inject as many species in the system as, 
as we can possibly inject. Thank you. Yeah. And, and we do this over and over again, and the net result is we gradually build up the species diversity. They're probably on the order of 30 or 40 species right in that block that's, that's being injected in. And the process of building this, these injections go on over and over and over again, and each time the species diversity comes up a little bit higher. When the numbers are tallied, over 600 species are counted. But only the passage of time will affirm the success of this ecosystem. The question is in all models is once you've experimented on the model, how do you then relate it to reality? It's not exactly the same. Just like Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, and the estuarine Everglades are not exactly the same as each other. They vary in a wide variety of ways. Well, once you set up a model, it too is a little different. So how do you relate the model to the reality? But it still is a very major step in terms of, of understanding why things happen, particularly when you change a system, when, when you uh, change the amount of fresh water that's flowing into it, you change the amount of sediment, the nutrients, or you increase the phosphorus that's flowing into a body of water. All of those things we argue about where it goes and why it happens. Well, this provides us a real tool so we can actually experiment, test, see what happens in the model, and then we can go back asking very specific questions of the wild environment. One positive indicator of success will be the growth of the fish population in the model. Now that they are in their new home, these fish will waste little time in ensuring the continuation of their species, continuing the life cycle that has existed for thousands of generations. A year later, when the fish populations of the estuary are checked, laboratory staff find that abundant reproduction has occurred in many species. The ecosystem and its inhabitants are prospering, much as in the wild, with some dominant species and others constantly changing. With the understanding and experience of many living models behind them, the Smithsonian crew has been able to create a new dimension in diversity and complexity that is evident here inside Biosphere 2. was once only the dream of a diverse group of scientists, engineers, and architects, has become a reality. The ecosystems within its glass walls are flourishing. It's likely that sometime in the next century, someone called a Biospherian will be standing in the Everglades, gathering oysters for dinner, checking on the mangroves to see how they're doing. And if they look up, they just might see the Earth hanging there in the sky. Gaia, the living planet. The importance of these experiments doesn't lie in our ability to sustain eight humans under glass for two years whether it's in the desert or on the moon. It lies in the knowledge gained by our minds and hands and hearts. Knowledge that will help us become a contributor to Mother Earth instead of merely a user. Learning how to live on other planets can teach us how to become better citizens of Earth. Cleaner air and purer water are within our grasp now. If only we don't let these opportunities to learn and act on what we learn slip through our fingers. For it isn't only the future of the Earth, but our own fate as well, that we hold in our hands. We may take for granted that the Earth will always be able to sustain us, but with more than five billion people using its resources, and with that human population growing dramatically, we all need to become aware of just how fragile nature really is. A Biosphere 2 is a model of life functioning in fine-tuned harmony. Perhaps if we all take the time to understand the complexities of our environment, Biosphere 1, we too can create balance and harmony in the natural world. Well, I'm Doug McConnell for the Discovery Channel. Thanks for watching.